Um, so I can now introduce our second uh, keynote for the morning. Um, Associate Professor Adriana Verghese, hopefully that's close. And uh, she will be talking about engaging coastal communities in restoration of underwater forests and meadows. Please. Um, thank you very much uh, for having me here today. It's a real pleasure uh, to be at this conference and it's a real pleasure to be, you know, in person at a conference full stop. So I'd like to thank the organizers. I can only imagine that organizing this mixed um, delivery conference must have been incredibly stressful and difficult. So thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you today about underwater restoration that is happening largely out of sight, out of mind, which is why we have created a whole lot of outreach and community engagement communities around building around our underwater restoration to try and raise awareness about ecosystems that we think are undervalued. So before I get started, I'd like to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land where we're meeting today, the Laraki people. And I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands and the waters where a lot of the research that I will be presenting has been done. And they're the Darawal, Gadigal, Bijigal, Darkinjang, and Wormai people. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. So let me start by telling you about an amazing ecosystem. It's called the Great Southern Reef. Can I get a show of hands? How many people may have heard of it? Okay, well, this is not bad. This is not bad. We're, 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 it's starting to work. So the Great Southern Reef is essentially the entire southern half of Australia. So the other side of where we are today. And it's defined by an interconnected system of reefs that are dominated by seaweeds. And these are seaweeds like this golden kelp, Eclonia radiata, which is quite remarkable in that it's these one species that can be found along the entire 8,000 kilometers of coastline of the Great Southern Reef. And these kelp and other species are the biological engines that, that fuel the ecosystem. Now, 70% of Australians live right next to the Great Southern Reef. It's extremely productive. Um, kelp forests of Eclonia radiata are up to 16 times more productive than wheat fields, the most productive wheat fields we have. Um, and they also contribute a lot to the Australian economy, more than $10 billion per year. And this is a conservative estimate, and it's mostly linked to the fact that these kelp forests support our two most valuable fisheries, abalone and rock lobster. Now, the Great Southern Reef is also very special because of its biodiversity and its endemism. So if we just focus on fish and invertebrates, about 77% of the species in the Great Southern Reef are found nowhere else on Earth. And these include some truly remarkable species like the weedy sea dragon or the giant cuttlefish or the eastern blue devilfish. Now, in comparison, say the Great Barrier Reef, which is 2,300 kilometers long, um, has amazing biodiversity, but a lot of those species are found in other Indo-Pacific reefs. So the Great Barrier Reef has about 7% of endemism when it comes to fish and invertebrates. So it's truly quite high, and it's for fish and invertebrates, but also seaweeds, and seaweeds are my passion. So the Great Southern Reef has the highest number of seaweeds anywhere in the world, and the highest levels of endemism. So it's a very important ecosystem. Um, however, we are starting to lose a lot of our kelp forests, and these losses are happening largely out of sight, out of mind. We're not hearing enough about these losses, and we're also not understanding what's causing these losses. We're not able to protect these ecosystems because we know so little about them in relative terms. Um, for example, the giant kelp forest of Tasmania, we've already lost 95% of this ecosystem, and yet most people don't even know that these ecosystems exist. And that's, that's a problem. Now, this lack of knowledge is linked to a lack of studies. So this is a, um, a, 
a review paper that some colleagues led by Scott Bennett published a few years ago. And this is the number of ecosystem services studies across different types of marine environments, things like coral reefs or, or mangroves or wetlands. And in white are the studies that are relevant to temperate reefs, to the Great Southern Reef. And as you can see, it's, it's literally nearly non-existent. So we know very little about these ecosystems. We do little research on them. And this is partly because we receive little funding. So this is um, data from the Australian Research Council. And we're in this case comparing coral reefs and temperate reefs. And in that five-year window, there was 10 times less money invested into understanding temperate reefs, even though it's such a big and important ecosystem. And the numbers haven't got, gotten better in recent years. Now, basically, I guess, you know, just as we care so deeply about coral reefs disappearing, coral reefs bleaching because of climate change, I guess we should care just as much uh, about kelps disappearing. And it's, it's, not, it's not more or less, obviously all ecosystems are important, but here's an example of one that we think is undervalued and under-researched. So let me now introduce to you one of the species that we are restoring. Um, it's called crayweed. The scientific name is Phyllospora camosa, and it, it really illustrates um, you know, how, how little we know about these ecosystems in a way. So this species makes beautiful lush underwater forests like this one. Um, it's called crayweed because crayfish associate with it. Um, and it's present along the entire southeastern side of Australia. So in red is the Great Southern Reef, in green is the distribution of crayweed. Now, this species when missing from the Sydney coastline, from 70 kilometers of coastline in the 1970s, 1980s, and nobody even knew about it. So this is like one of the major dominant formers in shallow reefs. It disappeared and we didn't even know about it until 2007 when Melinda Coleman and her team first identified that this species had gone missing. So why did it disappear? We think it's to do with sewage pollution at the time. So back in the 70s and 80s along the Sydney coastline, sewage was disposed of directly onto the coastline. And in fact, um, there's, there was even a, a rock band in Bondi uh, called the Bondi Cigars, which makes reference to largely untreated sewage that people used to swim and surf right next to back in the day. So really terrible stuff. Now, this pollution we think um, killed crayweed. It's very sensitive to pollution, especially at the zygote stage. Um, However, water quality has since improved dramatically. So before the 1990s, places like Bondi Beach were close to the public about 50% of the time. Nowadays, the water is amazing. And this is because of major engineering works where deep ocean outfalls were installed and other sewage is disposed of a few kilometers offshore in deep water so that sewage meat mixes with the water straight away. So the water quality got better, but crayweed just never came back on its own. So we started thinking about restoring it, and this is about 10 years ago now. But before we got started, we first wanted to know a little bit more about the biodiversity that crayweed supports. So we, we asked, does crayweed support a unique um, biodiversity uh, community, or does it kind of play the same function as the golden kelp that I just told you about that is present in the 8,000 kilometers? So we did some surveys, and basically take home message here is that crayweed is special. It supports a unique set of species, and this includes some of those highly valued fisheries, for example, abalone. So this is data from two sites near Bateman's Bay, where there can we, we found that there's up to 10 times more abalone next to crayweed than next to other species of seaweed or barrens. And it's not only the abalone, it's also the crayfish, that's where it gets its name, but also it's the epifauna, the microscopic organisms that live in and amongst the, the hole fast that attaches the seaweed to the um, seafloor and, and the fronds. So yes, it is different. Let's try and restore it. So, Initially, we started with just a small experiment. Um, this seaweed likes to live in super wave exposed areas. So we have to create it, this kind of meshes that we attach to the rock. And then we then kind of cable tie individuals. And the first question we had back in the day was, is the water quality good enough now for crayweed to survive in Sydney? 
And this is what the first patch of crayweed looks like. Um, this is my colleague Ziggy Marzinelli. Um, we did the restoration and we found that not only, well, that we found that the crayweed survived excellently well. So in this plot, we have four different treatments. So we have undisturbed crayweed. This is crayweed that we just tagged within touch, translocated, so crayweed from one forest to another crayweed forest and then transplanted. So crayweed from outside of Sydney into Sydney. And basically what we found is very high levels of survival. So about 80%. Um, so yes, the adults can survive. But the beautiful thing here was that not only did the crayweed survive, but it had babies. It had what we call crayweeds, uh, recruits. <laughs> and this is um, what they look like about nine months after planting. And so this one here is an adult that we planted. Uh, we secure it with cable ties, etc. And this is one that just now is living um, by attaching itself to the seafloor. And this is the beginning of the self-sustaining population. And we found that the, there was a method of restoring that increased the, the, the reproductive output of the seaweeds. Now, this is what that site that I showed you, that photograph, this is what the site looked like after eight years. So we start by just planting a few square meters, but then after a few years, it's, it expands and continues um, expanding hundreds of, kilo, of, of meters away. Um, so it is self-sustaining population. Now, the next question was, okay, we've brought back the species, have we brought back the biodiversity as well? And so we did some epifauna studies with the microscopic organisms I mentioned before. And this is data that shows how, um, this is the epifauna community, multivariate community of a reference crayweed site. This is a restored site. This is the golden kelp. And this is another dominant seaweed, sargassum. And what we can see is that it's already distinct, the restored populations from the golden kelp, and it is starting to resemble the reference sites. So things are moving in the, in the right direction. So at this stage, we knew that the water quality was good enough for the big individuals and for the recruits. Um, so we wanted to scale it up. However, to do this, um, and this is from the very beginning of the project, we thought if we succeed in bringing crayweed back, we really want to tell people about it because this is a good news story that can, can inspire other people. It's about, you know, there was a problem, it's been solved, and we are now reintroducing a species. So we put a lot of time and energy into developing a science communication campaign to tell that story. And this involved creating an entity. We call ourselves Operation Crayweed. We built, you know, we, we had a logo, we've built a website and, you know, all types of social media feeds. And we also made a film. And I'm gonna show you a little bit um, of the film, just the ending, because we then did some science communication kind of experiments um, that I'm gonna talk you through. So that is just the end of our first film. To be honest, we, we didn't think it would work. We were very skeptical about the success of our first experiment. It was a November day, I remember, still kind of cold in the water. And we went out to have a little look at them and, and check on the adult crayweed. It was actually amazing. Not only we saw that the transplanted crayweed was still there, but also that they had babies. On the cable ties we'd used to attach them, on the bolts that we'd used to drill the mats into the ground, they were absolutely everywhere. When we saw that it was actually working, we were really excited because it's a good news story. So Operation Crayweed is underway. It works, but what we'd like is to actually bring it back to the whole of Sydney. We need some money to keep going. It costs a lot of money to move crayweed around. We need boats and divers and reforest Sydney's underwater landscape. It would be amazing, you know, just go diving there, seeing this underwater forest, all the fish that like living in it, and hopefully lots of crayfish for, for us to, <laughs> to enjoy afterwards. So as you can see in this um, film, 
we started a crowdfunding campaign and that was um, to kind of get money to scale up our initial restoration. Now, this was just before Christmas. So we asked people to give an underwater tree for Christmas. So you could donate $20 to the project and you got a tree or 50 for a family or 500 for a patch. Um, and I think it became one of those kind of quirky Christmas stories when there's not a lot of other news. And it got really well picked up by the media, both locally by Channel 9 and the ABC, um, but also internationally. And I used to get an email every time that somebody donated and, and, and just went off. It just became, you know, a feel good um, Christmas present that people could give. And essentially, in, in just two months, we managed to raise $40,000, which greatly exceeded our expectations at that time. Now, some of the wonderful things that happened afterwards is that people heard about this project through the crowdfunding and then approached us to collaborate. And one of the big collaborations that came out of that was uh, with this public artist. Their name is uh, Jennifer Turpin and Michele Crawford. Um, they're public artists based in, based in Sydney, and all their artworks are what they call collaborations with nature. They heard about our project and they just loved this idea of kind of underwater gardening. So they got in touch because they had been invited to do uh, an installation at an art exhibition, an outdoor art exhibition, and they wanted to use the artwork to shine a light on the restoration that we were doing underwater, out of sight, out of mind. So this is Jennifer and Michele, and this shows the installation that they built. So it was like what they called an artwork site, like delineating the restoration that actually happened. So we restored a site in Bondi, and they kind of marked it out and tried to create ways to engage the community and let them know about the restoration that was happening. So those children um, went to art workshops and science workshops. We looked at the epifauna under a microscope, leaving the crayweed, and then they created these wearable art costumes that they paraded along this shoreline. So this is where the restoration took place. And there was a series of kind of, um, kind of, I don't know, work site kind of devices that the artists used to bring attention to the restoration. And we involved over a hundred um, school children. Now, we thought that this exhibition was a really good uh, opportunity because there was 500,000 people that came to this exhibition to do some, some experiments, to do some science. So this is work that is led by PhD candidate Lana Kashlik. And the, the, the question that we asked in this particular instance was whether a narrative style of science communication improves people's knowledge and attitudes about seaweeds and restoration. So, you know, we had made a film, we knew that it kind of worked, but we wanted to know, you know, why, why, is, why is it working and how can we do it better, essentially. So we did an experiment where we asked the visitors to this artwork exhibition um, to answer some questions. And the treatments that we had in the experiment were, we had a control where we did nothing. These are visitors to the exhibition. Um, then we had some visitors that watched the film with a um, iPad type, a tablet type implement. And then we created four different types of podcasts. In two of the podcasts, the information we delivered was exactly the same as in the film. So what you've just watched, and it had a narrative arc. Like you saw in the film, it's all kind of very personal and dramatic, and there's, there's a narrative kind of arc. In the other two podcasts, we had this exact same information, but delivered in a factual way, like a textbook, just giving the facts, but without personalizing anything, right? And then we had some that had sound design, music, and, and that kind of thing, and one that didn't have at all. And then we measured people's knowledge and people's attitudes. And I'm only going to show you a couple of examples of the results here. Um, this is what it looked like. So people were invited to yeah, either watch or, or listen to podcasts. Um, and they got some free headphones with Operation Crayweeds on the side mm -hmm. as a thank you as well. Um, so we got 618 uh, responses, which is quite good. I'd like to bring your attention to the fact that 90% of our visitors um, were Sydney Siders. 10% uh, were from Bondi itself, the place where the restoration took place, uh, but 90%. So this is very much uh, reflecting the Sydney Cider views. Um, there was a wide range of ages, all adults. 
There was more females, slightly more females than males, six, about 58% female, and that reflects the fact that more women attended the exhibition. So the first question we asked is, in recent decades, has Sydney water got, well, has it improved? Has it stayed the same or has it worsened? Now, I've just told you all that Sydney water has massively, massively improved. In Bondi Beach, 50% of the time, the beaches were closed. Now they're always open, right? So this is the correct answer. But look at what the control people said. This is so interesting to me. So this is uh, people that haven't been exposed to any science communication and about 50% of respondents thought that water quality in Sydney has got worse. Only 25% knew that it had improved. And this is really interesting because I think it reflects how we're much better at explaining the things that are going wrong than the things that go right. So when we fix a problem, we don't communicate it and then people forget. It may be linked to this kind of mean world hypothesis kind of um, syndrome. Uh, so the fact that, you know, the media is constantly bombarding us with stories of things going wrong and, you know, it just wouldn't make the news, right? If everything's just good and today's a sunny day to go for a walk, right? That's not going to make the news. So maybe we are influenced by a world that is telling us all the time that things are going wrong and that's what's maybe shaping our thinking. I'm not sure. Let me now show you what happens after the science communication. So this is the film and this is the narrative podcast and this is the factual podcast with and without music. Music didn't have an, inf an, an impact on anything, so I'm not going to talk about that. But um, all science communication works, all of it. You know, the film, the factual, the, the podcast, it doesn't matter, it all works. After hearing the science communication, people then realize that Sydney water has in fact improved dramatically, which is great. Now, we asked a few different knowledge questions. I'm just highlighting um, one where there was no impact, and that was the same for all questions except for one. And this is um, the question that was different. So, this was what we considered the hardest question in terms of the knowledge. Um, so, we asked, why has Crayweed restoration been successful. And the options we gave were because crayweed transplants are surviving, because crayweed transplants are surviving and reproducing, because seagrasses are not outcompeting the seaweeds, we just made that up, and no response. And in the control treatment, we can see that people kind of answered, you know, randomly, really. A lot of people said no response, and then, you know, equal kind of waiting. Um, and um, that's normal, they didn't know anything about this project. When we gave them the science communication, we found a significant effect of narrative. Both the film and the narrative podcast showed a much higher proportion of respondents that correctly answered the question. So crayweed restoration is successful because the crayweed has not only survived, but it has had babies, right? So it shows that, yes, there are benefits to using narrative that helps you to um, yeah, communicate the more kind of complex bits um, of our research. And we think this is linked to the fact that, as, as you may recall from the video, we placed the Cravies kind of story at the climax of the video. So I've just shown you the end just before the climax, but basically we set the scene, we talk about the water quality, etc. And then, you know, the music kind of comes up, we talk about the Cravies, uh, about the Cravies in a very kind of emotive way. And we think that this is likely why that bit of information was better um, retained and understood by, pe by people that listen to the narrative version. And this does fit in with quite a lot of literature that tells you that information placed at the climax tends to be retained more accurately and for longer. Let me now move away from the science communication. Um, I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about the Crayweed Restoration Project and some of the work that we've been doing. So we started by just restoring and scaling up. We've now been adding some layers to try and future-proof our restoration. So we didn't want to just re-establish crayweed forests. We wanted to re-establish them and, you know, and hope to future-proof them so that they stay 
resilient for years to come. And this is work that um, has been led by recent PhD graduate Georgina Wood. So in this review paper, we first kind of contemplated all the different uh, options that we may use to future-proof restoration. And this includes things like genetics and assisted evolution, manipulating microbial interactions, uh, developing sustainable stock, uh, manipulating species interactions, positive and negative, and green engineering. And then uh, Georgina's thesis focused a lot on the genetic sides of things. So when it comes to restoration and genetics, there's four kind of strategies that we may contemplate, and they go from like less interventionist on the left to more interventionist. So at the most basic kind of level, if we want to re-establish a species, we may just choose to recover it. Uh, and this may involve knowing nothing about the genetic makeup of the species or the restored population. Um, we may want to kind of revive it, so replicate a known genetic baseline. And this requires obviously knowledge about the genetic structure of the, of the species around the area. Um, and then ideally replicating that. Now, both these kind of approaches have um, uncertain long-term survival in the sense that there might be potential maladaptation or there might be low genetic diversity and it might lead to extinction. The more intrusive kind of approaches would be reinforcing or redefining. And this is where we improve the genetic baseline or we even create a new one. So if we improve it, it may be because, for example, we sample in bright spots. So we go looking for the donor of the restoration populations in areas that have been affected by stress and we look for the survivals, for, for example, or we might be that we just work hard at increasing genetic diversity full stop right that's improving the genetic baseline the alternative or the, the most extreme version here would be to create a new genetic baseline this is where you know the baseline and you actually edit the specific genes that you're interested in in manipulating to increase the chances of future survival so with crayweed we're basically kind of in revive between revive and reinforce so um, one of the first things we did with the Georgina's thesis was to use genetics to optimize and measure the success of the crayweed restoration. So we made, measured the genetic structure of crayweed populations north and south of the Sydney region, where it's gone missing. And then we chose the donor populations using a mix of north and south populations to kind of try and replicate the nearby uh, structure. And here in this photograph, you can actually see, I don't know if you can see it well, but you see this lighter color and darker color. So the, the north and south populations were actually visibly different when you put them together. They were phenoty phenotypically different. Um, and we measured the um, F1 generation of the cravies after the successful kind of take up of the, of the population. And what we found was that even the one of the phenotypes the adults disappeared much faster than the other. In, when, it came, when it came to the actual um, cravies, they actually represented a really good mixture of the north and the south. So we successfully replicated the genetic structure, essentially. Now, the next stage is um, we've genotyped the entire, well, we've, we've you know, we've taken samples from the entire um, distribution of crayweed all the way from Port Macquarie to the bottom of Tasmania. And we have looked at the genetic structure. We see that there's high connectivity throughout, but in the range edges, there is increased structure. And we can see that in particular, the warmer edge populations in Port Macquarie, there seems to be, the structure seems to be correlated to maximum sea surface temperature. So it may be that there is some potential adaptation to those warmer conditions. The next step is to do experiments to verify whether that is indeed the case, and then contemplate whether we can bring in those genotypes into the Sydney populations. So this is where we're at with crayweed at the moment. We have six healthy, self-sustaining crayweed sites. They're mostly, we don't touch them. We do a, a few top-ups in some areas, but they, they just go by themselves. And then we have others in various stages of progress. And of course, our dream here would be to restore crayweed along the entire um, coastline.
Now, I'd like to finish up by telling you about the latest um, outreach community engagement program that we've been doing. And this is one that finished literally just this Sunday. And it's been a month long event. Um, it's called the Manly Seaweed Forest Festival. And it's been a major kind of art science collaboration. So it was at the Manly Art Gallery and with the same artists, Jennifer Turpin and Michele Crawford. So they did a whole lot of artworks which are essentially pressed seaweeds that were um, framed in transparent um, structures that then created this kind of shadows that you may see here so there was a part of the exhibition that was just the artwork and then we had a whole lot of activities so in the main room we had a giant kelp forest this is bull kelp that was hanging on the ceiling just two tons of bull kelp that were underpinning the 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 kind of room and then in this room we had all sorts of activities one of the activities we had were panel discussions and we had uh, five of them here's some examples so one of the sessions was about seaweeds being a victim and unlikely hero in the fight against climate change and we had people like tim flannery who has written a book about seaweeds we had researchers we had oscar mcmahon he's the founder of a brewery a beer brewery that is using the co2 produced by a burrowing process to grow microalgae that then gets used as fuel so an entrepreneur um, sam elson he's a, a farmer that has um, started the first farm of asparagopsis armada it's a seaweed that um, stops uh, well it kills the archaea bacteria in the gut of cows so you may have heard about this seaweed that if you feed it to the cows it stops them burping methane so it reduces methane emissions so that was one of the discussions another one was about what we call the awe and wonder of our underwater forests, and this speaks to this kind of need to raise awareness about our underwater forests. And we had um, Costa from the ABC, we had Olympian Shane Gould, who is an ocean swimmer and a passionate uh, supporter of the Great Southern Reef. We had artist Jennifer Turpin, Alex Campbell from Operation Crayweed, and Robert Cooley from the Game Rangers Indigenous Group. We had quite a few of these. Um, the last example I'm going to give is about food. So a big component. It was about art, science, and food. And so we had chefs, we had food journalists, we had uh, traditional elders telling us about the traditional uses of seaweeds. And these were incredibly well attended, these talks. We also had cooking <laughs> demonstrations. So this is Chef Gary Fishwick showing how to um, make seaweed bread, which is absolutely delicious. Um, and we also did community plantings. So we went out there with the community and planted crayweed. This is in fresh water. Costa joined us that day because he just fell in love with the project. And, um, and what we find is that by involving the community in the planting, it increases a sense of stewardship. You know, these, these people tend to, you know, they live in the area, they go snorkeling, and they've never thought about the seaweeds. You know, they, they, they look at the fish, they've never thought about the habitat that sustains them. So by, by involving them in the restoration, they, they kind of become, uh, yeah, custodians of the seaweed forest, and they start to differentiate between the different types. And they tell us when our restoration is going well, when there are problems, they send us messages we also had we had a um, we had a, a performative dance like a, a, a um, we had a, a dance we had a, a musical composition we had science workshops uh, looking at the epifauna we had art workshops um, pressing seaweeds and using cyanotypes so all hands-on activities where people interacted and participated actively with the seaweeds and this is one of the things that I'm most excited about. Uh, so we've created a whole lot of educational resources about the Great Southern Reef, which can be accessed through this website. They involve indigenous culture, marine research, sustainable seas concepts and conservation, their curriculum aligned. And as part of the festival, we hosted um, a series of workshops, some for students and some for teachers. The idea of teach the teachers um, how to use these learning resources. This is an example of one of the workshops. And um, these um, teaching resources include a lot of films because going back to that science experiments that we showed, we found that using narrative, and in the case of, of underwater ecosystems, because they are out of sight, we think that using films can really bring home the, the importance of these ecosystems. So 
Um, I'm going to show you the film that has come out of this project. This is a project that is led by Stefan Andrews, uh, who's here. Um, I was a part of a National Geographic grant that we put together to try and um, build these educational resources. And let me show you a film about the Great Southern Reef, which has just been finished. We were doing some work right across Australia from New South Wales, around Tasmania, Southern Australia and Western Australia. Everyone we talked to was just so passionate about their local reefs and everybody would tell you, oh, we've got the best local reef here or we've got the best secret spot for fishing or we've got the best wave here. And we realised that everybody was talking about the same thing. It's just this broad passion right across this place. We need to harness this energy and try to put a voice behind it. Just like the Great Barrier Reef, we have a sign equivalent that is equally unique, it's equally valuable, and, and we basically felt that it deserved a great identity. And so what name better than the Great Sign Reef? It was a really inspired idea to give it a name because I think it then recognizes the interconnectedness of all these systems that are thousands of kilometers apart, but they share some very common features, you know, like the, the presence of this golden kelp, you know, along 8,000 kilometers of coastline. Branding what we have out the front just makes sense. This done properly will be huge. All people that are saltwater people feel that the spirit that comes from within the sea is something that is like deep within your blood. You have to show people what is out there and, and educate them of how you respect that environment. I think it's a great idea to identify the area as the Great Southern Reef. It gives everybody a name to put to something which supports the diversity of industries that we have here. My hope for the Great Southern Reef is to unite a lot of the pride and passion that we see right across Southern Australia. We have some really large challenges facing the Great Southern Reef and by uniting our efforts, uniting our calls to look after and protect the Great Southern Reef, we can achieve a lot and maintain it for future generations to come. All right, so just to finish up on that high note, I hope, I'd like to acknowledge the many collaborators that I've been mentioning throughout, but Ziggy Marzinelli, Alex Campbell, Peter Steinberg, Melinda Coleman, Brendan Kelleher, Damon Bolton, Derek Cruz, Maddie Langley, their Operation Crayweed, essentially, um, along with me. Um, Stefan Andrews and Scott Bennett have been driving forces behind a lot of this Great Southern Reef um, educational materials and science communication, and um, a special acknowledgement of the PhD students, Georgina Wood and Lana Kashlik, who have been driving some of the research that I have shown you. And, um, just with a final plug, if I could just let you know, if you're interested in seaweeds, I hope you are a bit more interested now than you were before. Um, do consider attending these talks by Aaron Eager, Clayton Mead, and Julia Ferretto. Julia working on seagrasses, which I haven't spoken about today because she will be giving that presentation um, on Thursday at 12 o'clock. Um, so with that further ado, if uh, there's any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. <laughs> Adriana, that's a lovely talk. Thank you very much. Um, I was wondering why, well, what your thoughts are on why the Sydney Council or whoever fixed the water quality problem didn't talk to their voters more. You know, like why did it take a crayweed project to point out that the investment that they'd made was worth it? I mean, that's taxpayers. Yeah, absolutely Dollars. right. I mean, I, to be honest, I don't know the answer. I have had meetings with Sydney Water um, where, where, you know, I've, I've I went to them, I'll be honest, looking for money, going, look, we have a great story here. Why don't you help us fund some of this research and we tell that story together. Um, and, you know, at the end, they didn't come up with the goods, unfortunately. I don't know why they didn't do it themselves, but I think, um, I think it's a matter of the attention just shifting to the next problem and the next problem and the next problem. And we do still have water quality problems. You know, when it rains, like there are some places in Sydney, like Coogee, for example, that is still problematic. And I think that that's where all the energies are going. And, you know, once the problem is fixed, we're too quick to move to the next problem without going, okay, now let's invest some resources in telling people about this. 
There was, um, so the Greybeard story was actually featured in Australia's Ocean Odyssey, which was an, a documentary, and they sourced footage from the news from the 1980s, which I, I'm, I'm from Spain originally, so I wasn't around, but um, there was like 500,000 people that organized a rock concert to complain about the sewage pollution in Bondi Beach. When I saw that footage, I was like, wow, you know, and how can it be that we've forgotten all about that? It's, it's amazing, right? Hi. Um, with the, the month-long program you just had yeah. and the room full of bull kelp, yeah. was it still smelly? No, was, it, was there odour in the room? No. And did odour yeah. take people to the sea yeah. in their thinking? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. And we, we thought about this a lot at the meetings when we were preparing. Uh, you know, I don't mind the smell of seaweeds, but I'm aware a lot of people do. Um, so I was really worried that the room was going to be really smelly. No, it wasn't at all. Um, because it was really well dried, basically. And then the artist did put some lacquer to stop it from um, um, getting more moisture. Um, so yeah, not smelly at all. We did, however, in every single session that we did, there was food and the food had a smell and a taste. And a, so yeah, that was part of the experience we were trying to create was playing with those senses in a positive way. <laughs> yeah, I don't mind the smell, but yeah, the same sort of thing. Mm. As long as there's that tie with the senses as well. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I really enjoyed that. Um, I, I live up here now in the NT, but I actually grew up on that New South Wales South Coast. So it's like close to my heart and actually made me a little bit homesick. So yeah. it was really nice to hear all that. Um, I just, I mean, I just had one thought uh, with all the uh, promotional sort of stuff that you did. Did you get any response from the Department of Fisheries or anyone like that, like considering that economic? Yeah. Benefit? So Mel Coleman works at Fisheries. So she's one of the, she's the person that first identified it going missing. And then she's been involved in the restoration all along. So Fisheries are partners. But one of the, I think one of the great things about this project is that both the greenies and the fishers love it, you know, because the fishers can see how it's going to bring back species that they love. And the greenies just love restoring habitat because it's a good thing for the planet, right? So it kind of ticks both boxes, which is rare. Yeah, it's a win-win for a lot of people. Yeah. The other day when we were doing restoration, we found uh, for the first time like a baby crayfish in, in, in one of the restored crayweeds, which was quite exciting. So. Uh, yeah, thank you for that great presentation. Can I just ask, did you have any thoughts why there was no difference in the, in the films where there was music and where there was no music? So the films always had music because we thought that'd be too weird to, you know, so the film was always with music, the full thing, right? It was the podcast that had music or no music. I, I haven't shown it, but one of the things, so we, we also ask people, um, how much would you pay to restore this ecosystem, for example? And we did find the significant impact of music in that people liked factual with no music and narrative with music which makes sense because that's, you know, cognitively it's, it's what, what we are used to, right? So if you had a factual podcast, which was textbook style with music, people didn't believe it and they, they trusted it less and they gave less money. Whereas um, with a narrative, if it didn't have music, it wasn't as powerful. So that's the only interesting thing that we found with regards to music. Um, hi, thank you. Fan fantastic talk. Uh, a documentary film that featured cult forests quite heavily um, has kind of entered the popular culture recently and, and uh, won an Oscar for best documentary. So my octopus teacher, and I was just wondering like you as a science communicator, what, what, what did you think of that? I mean, I'm, I'm completely biased. I was just so excited that kelp forests were on screen that I was just always going to love that film, you know. Um, I, I think it's it's really interesting storytelling because it puts the animal, the relationship between animals and, and, and humans at the center point, you know. So I think it's, it's really interesting, you know. I, I, as a scientist and knowing the ecosystems, I was probably also concentrating too much about like, could this really happen in this time frame and that kind of thing, you know? But I think overall, what I think is it, it's done is that it's done a really good job uh, connecting people with the marine environment and with cooler 
temperate reefs, kelp forests, etc. So I'm 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 delighted with it. Apparently, um, the sales of octopus have also gone down dramatically. <laughs> as a food, or as, as a, a food, yeah. Any other questions? If not, I'm going to ask you a question. Um, in, in your data, uh, when I saw what a six, when you asked the question, what was successful or not? To me, the, it appeared that the factual um, came out best. Did I misread that graph? Um, let me see. We can get back to it. Typical on my yeah, yeah. data. So the correct answer there is crayfish, yeah. transplants are surviving and reproducing. So oh, that's, yeah, there's a, uh, there's a mistake in the color coding. Okay. Yeah, sorry. So this should be, they are trans dark surviving fish. and reproducing. Yeah, it's sorry, it's a, it's a mistake in the, in the labels. Great. Yeah. <laughs> well picked up though. We're about to submit this, so we better get it right. <laughs> so your review will be easier now. Yeah, thanks. That's why we do this. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, yeah, we do. I need, there's water people here, so they have to be interested. And we have lots of time, so. I was really interested in your mention of um, using genetics and gene drives have a lot of promise for the future of um, creating resilient ecosystems, but the stakeholder public perception of using those things, ge genetic modifications, it's a huge challenge. Um, have you been working with that? Have you considered that for the future? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And in that paper that I mentioned about future proofing, we, we had an, an, an ethicist philosopher as, as part of the authorship team, because I agree that it's, it's one of the things that we need to decide, you know, how much are we willing to manipulate? What's what, you know, what's the right thing to do and, and what species should be safe, you know? So obviously in the Great Barrier Reef, there's a lot of work being done on trying to um, breed heat tolerant corals. Um, should we do the same with the seaweeds um, or, you know, in places, a lot of my research is also on climate change in places where we're losing kelp and corals are starting to take over, you know, if we only have so much money, should we put our money towards trying to save the seaweed for us or helping the corals come in because they, they at least they, they, they provide ecosystem functions that are valuable? Um, all these questions need to be considered. And I feel that in some ways the science is going faster than our thinking. So all I can all I can say is that we need to talk about it. We need to think about it more. And then I do think we need to develop the tools so that we are ready. Um, but it's a difficult decision and with the marine environment, um, you know, because nobody owns these coastlines that we are restoring, there's that added level of, you know, who should make the decisions? Um, is it okay to bring crayweed from Port Macquarie and put it in Sydney? Is that, you know, who, you know, should, should it be society? How, how do we, how do we structure this? It's, it's, it's complex. I'm going to ask another question because I've got the microphone. Um, <laughs> With the art installation and the way that the children were given things, were they actually plastic? <laughs> and and how did how did the people feel about that? I yeah. suppose because it looked like a large plastic yeah. installation yeah. of potential marine debris that will blow off and yeah. create a problem with itself. It's it's a really good point, and it's one that was um, much discussed because the installation was outdoors. And it, it was like an artwork site, as in like, it was simulating like a work site, like a building work site, but for something that was happening on the water. And we considered using a whole lot of different materials, but this is the only material that survives outdoor conditions. You know, now all those materials have been recovered and either reused or recycled. Um, we have a similar thing with the materials we use in the actual restoration, like the meshes, etc. We've used, we've tried coconut fiber alternatives, biodegradable plastic, and just nothing, um, nothing works. Like it literally gets ripped out in two weeks because of the wave exposure. So, but yeah, I mean, I, I brought it up with the with the artists. At the end, we we decided to use it. There were a few letters written in the kind of local uh, magazines and we've responded. There was an interesting kind of um, conversation. I think if I was to do it again, 
I would avoid the plastic altogether because it, it sends kind of mixed messages, but that would have meant doing something different because yeah, we couldn't use an alternative. So yeah, it, it is an interesting time where we have to, yeah, we, we speak about these things. Uh, can I help you with your philosophical question on yes. whether Port Macquarie Crayweed should come south? Uh, with 6 million people sitting on your doorstep, I would say the answer is yes, yes, and yes. And I would say it from the background of a seed biologist, seed collector, um, working on threatened plant communities in the Murray Mallee. Um, we're faced with this all the time. Do we take <clears throat> seed from that provenance and work with that at that location? or in the case, say, of bull oak woodlands, which are threatened across the Murray-Darling Basin? Do we take it from the driest location and put it into locations 200 kilometres further south where rainfall might be 140 mil higher? My answer is yes, yes, and yes, every time under climate change. And my feeling is that in terrestrial circles, uh, there has been more thinking done and there's been more manipulation. I feel like in the marine system, you know, management has meant marine protected areas where nothing is touched, where it seems like we're much more afraid to uh, manipulate things in the ocean than we are on land. And maybe it's because there's so much more connectivity in the ocean. So the potential unintended consequences and dispersal, etc. maybe it's greater. I don't know. But um, yeah, thank you for that. I think um, on a personal level, I think I'm with you. Um, but I think, you know, we need to make the decision together. So 